advocacy has become a, a big business in, uh, in the U.S. And I hope that I can tell you there are some results and there is some return on investment for all of the time and money and energy that we invest in bicycle advocacy. Uh, the League has been around for uh, 134 years. We have a very rich history, and in the 1880s and 1890s, the organization was one of the most powerful lobbying groups in America, in the U.S. Uh, I'm sorry to say in the 20th century, we uh, let things go a little bit. Um, this thing called the car came along and sort of took over. And, uh, but now we're back in the 21st century to reclaim our place on the streets of, of, uh, of U.S. cities. Um, we uh, pay tribute to that tradition and that history. Uh, we just rebranded. We just came up with a new organizational logo and, and, uh, and look. And um, I was very surprised that all of the people we talked to who were under the age of 30 years old all wanted to go back to the winged wheel, to the old original logo from the organization in the 1880s. I thought, because believe it or not, I'm over 30, uh, I thought that we would um, want a, a much more stylistic, a much more uh, a kind of a modern art type of bike logo that we used. But no, the, the, the younger generation wanted the retro vintage look that we heard about earlier this afternoon. So that's um, uh, our uh, organization. And I'm pleased to say, although everything is relative, everything you hear from the U.S. Uh, is, uh, is always relative, we are an optimistic people by, uh, by birth, I think. Um, so we always tell a good story. We always make it sound as if all the charts are going this way and are going up. Um, but it's a very relative picture. So in the U.S., Bicycle use in the last 10 years has increased, uh, on average, in, in U.S. cities by almost 50%. In the cities that have been more bicycle friendly, the ones that are uh, among our designated bicycle friendly communities that have done more to be ready for, for bicyclists, that increase has been much bigger, much more pronounced. So in cities like Portland and Seattle and Chicago and New York City, the increase in bicycle use in the last 10 years has been 80%. So there's a really good story to tell there, uh, but I'm afraid to say that as a nation, we are still at exactly the same level as Lima, which is 0.9% uh, journeys to work being made by bike. It's increasing, and the story is, is definitely on an upward trend, uh, and uh, there are a lot of good reasons for that. The American city has been reborn. That there is, uh, when I first moved to the United States in 1988, no one wanted to live in U.S. cities. Uh, everyone assumed they were dead and buried, and that, that uh, they were just places you didn't want to go, didn't want to be. Um, and that has changed completely. And now people are moving back. People of all ages are moving back to the American city. The younger generation is uh, learning to drive. Uh, uh, less frequently and less quickly. People are driving much less for the first time in generations. Uh, vehicle miles of travel in the U.S. is going down, and the trends show that it will continue to go down. Uh, but again, it's all relative. It's still a very small percentage. Twenty years ago, Rex will remember this, uh, there was a national bicycling and walking study published uh, that said we should double the, the level of bicycle and pedestrian use and cut the number of crashes by 10%. Uh, since 1990, uh, when the numbers were, were um, uh, the start point for that uh, plan, uh, we have gone up 50%, not 100% in the level of use, and we have cut crashes by more than 10%. So we're making some progress, but it's still just um, around the edges. The good news again is that there is strong public support for increasing cycling in the U.S., for making the investment, for making the hard choices about what we do in our cities and on our roads and in our infrastructure uh, to create a more bicycle-friendly country, more bicycle-friendly communities. There is widespread public support for it, um, and that's something that I think we sometimes forget. People really do like cycling. They really do think it's a good idea. Uh, and uh, when you ask people, 
Uh, of course, for all the reasons we've heard about today, people think we should be doing more of this, uh, and that it would be better for all of us if we rode our bikes more. So there's widespread support, and that's uh, certainly true even in the United States. I did. I heard someone say, uh, a, a political commentator say that the um, car is no longer king in the U.S. It's still not very far from the throne. But it's not king anymore. People think about other things. They think about transit and walking and bicycling, and, uh, and attitudes are definitely changing even in U.S. cities. Um, the, uh, another piece of good news from the U.S. is that um, we know why this is happening. We know what to do. Uh, as uh, I think Rodrigo showed this afternoon, we also or this morning, we also know what not to do and how to not make this stuff work. But we know what the blueprint is to create a more bicycle-friendly community, to create a more bike-friendly city. We know what people need, what they say they want, what infrastructure works and doesn't work. We keep learning more, and we should keep learning more with research and evaluation. But we know what it takes. It's not rocket science, as we say, to, uh, to, to figure out what it takes to get people riding bikes. Um, and we know how that happens. Uh, we know how to bring those blueprints to life. We have a program called the Bicycle Friendly Community Program that designates and recognizes communities for uh, at different levels for their success and their progress in becoming bike friendly. Uh, one of our platinum level communities is uh, in the audience. Um, we had to move the goalposts to, to, so they still had something to, to uh, aim for. So now we have a diamond level that they have not yet achieved. Um, but uh, we know, after looking at over 700 communities' applications, uh, what it takes to, to change the way cities look and feel for bicycling. It needs a political champion, a leader, a mayor, who realizes the benefit of community events and does the political calculation that this is a popular thing to do, again, as we heard earlier today. We know that it takes uh, a real champion who is willing to set real targets and action plans and hold people accountable to getting those things done, not just standing in front of the cameras taking a picture and putting your folding bike in the back of the car uh, as soon as the photo is done. Um, we know that it takes a, a connected network of, of infrastructure. This isn't difficult to, to, uh, to decide. And we know that it takes actually getting people out on bikes through incentive programs, through encouragement programs and, and uh, events like Ciclovias, like smart trips or individualized marketing, like bike share. Those all make a big difference and are all part of the agenda that we give to cities uh, when they ask us, what do we need to do to be more bike friendly? We know what the answer is. The question is, are you prepared to do it? Uh, we have had success in, uh, in getting uh, federal money, federal transportation funding spent on bicycling and walking. And again, it sounds like a huge amount of money, and it looks like the, the graph is, again, going in the right direction, um, but it's still about one and a half percent of all the federal funds that are spent on transportation. So just as we heard, and that's bicycling and walking. So just as we heard from Mexico, just as we've heard from uh, other countries in Latin America, uh, the, uh, the, the representation is, is still poor. The funding levels are still not uh, matching the level of use, the level of safety, and the crash numbers that we feel that it should. But there's a lot of money that's been invested in bicycling and walking. And part of the reason for that is that I think as a movement in the United States, our local organizations and advocacy groups and our national organizations and advocacy groups have been getting better and are stronger and more effective than they have been um, in the past. Again, when I first came to the United States uh, from England, uh, I was able to convince the Immigration Service uh, that I would, be not, I would not be taking a job from an American to be a bicycle lobbyist in, uh, in Washington, D.C. There was no one doing it. There was no uh, uh, infrastructure for advocacy back then, and now there's a, a whole business around bicycle advocacy. Um, we put on each year a national bike summit that has about 800 people from all over the country. It has the bicycle industry, it has uh, NGOs in Washington, D.C., state and local advocates and organizations from around the country who all go to visit their members of Congress, just as you heard uh, from, uh, from Mexico, uh, similar process. 
And this is our uh, Secretary of Transportation, who famously uh, clambered up on the table in order to get the attention of the crowd and to announce uh, a new policy on, on bicycling and walking um, at the National Bike Summit. And uh, we have really changed the conversation around cycling in Washington, D.C. by uh, putting on a suit and tie, by showing up and, and playing constructively uh, with uh, politicians and making a good case for more bicycle and walking. Um, we do the National Bike Summit each year in March, and before the event this year, um, we decided that we should do some research and find out how people think of us uh, on Capitol Hill in, our, in, in the United States Congress and in Washington, D.C. It's a bit of a scary thing to do, to uh, have someone independently go up and ask uh, a group of people what they think of you, how well you're presenting your message, uh, whether your agenda is, makes sense or not, uh, whether you're doing a good job. Uh, but we felt as if we really needed to do it and learned a lot of really valuable lessons by doing that. One of them was really quite surprising. We heard from people that we get it. Bicycling is part of the mix. You're not all of the mix and don't for a second think that you're, you know, 100% of the solution. But we get that bicycling is part of the transportation mix and solution. And I'm not sure that we always believe that. I, I think sometimes we still, uh, even if someone says, yep, I, I get it, we still want to beat them over the head with more information and more statistics and more numbers and more reasons why bicycling is great. Um, but actually, people get it. Now they want us to show up and be part of the conversation about uh, what role it plays, how it can combine with transit, how it can effectively change urban transport. It's our responsibility now to do that. Um, we discovered that um, even if people are opposed to the things we're lobbying for, um, we've, we've spent 20 years with that funding program, uh, with dedicated funding, a, a budget, a line item in the budget for bicycling and walking, um, and uh, that was uh, removed in uh, 2012. That was another reason for doing our research. Uh, but that was changed, and we wanted to know why, and we wanted to know why uh, individual members of Congress, quite powerful ones, seemed to be anti-bike. They were calling their colleagues and saying, vote against this funding for bicycling and walking. And we assumed that it was anti-bike, that they didn't like bikes, didn't think that, 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 that it was important. Uh, this was one of those people. Uh, the gentleman on the left is, the, is Eric Cantor. He's one of the top uh, spokespeople, one of the top Republicans in the, in the uh, US Congress. And he was personally calling our supporters and people they were asking to support the bicycling agenda, saying, don't support this uh, bicycling issue. And we assumed he didn't like us. It turns out that wasn't it at all. He's perfectly fine with people bicycling. He just doesn't think that there should be dedicated budgets for anything, not just bicycling. So it wasn't about bicycling. It wasn't about being anti-bike. And here he is standing in front of a group of cyclists from Richmond, Virginia, his hometown, which is hosting the World Cycling Championships in 2015. And uh, he was saying, tell me what I can do to help. I get that uh, that communities should be more bikeable, more walkable. Um, we need to be so to be ready for when the world of cycling comes to Richmond, Virginia. I, re I thought I had died and gone to heaven when I heard him say that. Um, it was not expected at all, but um, uh, it changed our perception. People were not against bicycling. They were against the uh, uh, the, the way we were trying to get funding for bicycling. Next slide. Uh, we also discovered that it's uh, not about, uh, about the bike. Um, we are, we're a membership organization. Our members are enthusiasts. They love bicycling. They have, uh, you know, they are 55 year old white guys with beards and with more money than uh, you can imagine to spend on bikes. That's who our people are. They're passionate about cycling. We have to tell them now to not be so passionate about uh, just about bikes, but to also talk about walking and transit and other issues, land use and other tricky uh, issues in the U.S. Um, because cycling is, for most people, is not the only thing they care about. That's an important and a difficult lesson for some of our members to hear. Um, we learned from this research uh, in Congress that while uh, data and numbers and evaluations are important, Personal experience and stories always triumph over actual facts. Now, I don't know if that's just 
you lead to the United States Congress. Um, but uh, uh, the power of, of personal experiences and seeing people uh, uh, um, do things themselves is, is really critical. This is Pennsylvania Avenue, looking towards the U.S. Capitol. It's the, the nation's main street. And miracle upon miracles, it has bike lanes right up the middle of it. And um, I know, because I use it fairly often, that there are always people out there. The Department of Transportation has numbers that say how many people per hour ride on these bike lanes. But one key member of Congress is convinced that because he never sees anyone riding in them, that no one ever rides in them. And it doesn't matter how many bits of paper, how many reports, how many presentations you give, if he doesn't see it and experience it and know it firsthand, if the right person doesn't come and tell him that there are people using us and it's worthwhile, he won't believe it. So we need the data, we need evaluation, of course, but we also need stories, we also need personal experience, we also need to get people out on bikes, even if it's just for a, a quick photo opportunity, uh, just so they see what's happening firsthand. And we need to make sure that we support our friends and allies. We learned that uh, we uh, were not doing that enough. Now, politicians are, uh, they are uh, fickle, they, uh, they need a lot of attention, they need a lot of care and feeding, and that's okay because they can get things done for us and we need to do that. And it doesn't matter uh, if, uh, if we think we've paid enough attention to them and said thank you enough, if they don't think that, then we, we're not doing our job. So uh, we know we have to pay special attention to those uh, champions uh, and, uh, and make sure that, that they know we appreciate them. That's part of being an effective political uh, organization. I think the most encouraging and exciting thing we learned from this research uh, um, before the National Bike Summit is that the perception of cycling in Washington, D.C. has changed in large part because of the bike sharing system that we have. Uh, we have the Bixie system, about 2,000 bikes, 200 stations, and um, the perception of, of people on Capitol Hill before bike sharing went in was that cyclists were uh, they all were, were lycra, they all sped through the streets knocking people over, getting in the way, holding people up. Uh, and that was maybe four years ago, <coughs> that was the perception of cyclists. Now the perception of cyclists is a, 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 a businesswoman on a bike share bike using a system that's an actual transport system that actually gets you from point A to point B that they can see all over the city it actually works, and that um, is a, a very important change in perception for us as we do our job moving forward. Um, we also have a big job to do in changing the perception of, of cyclists in the U.S. It, it's a, you know I, everything again is relative. This is unique to the U.S. perhaps, but um, this is how we are seen in too many places uh, by elected officials, by uh, the, the public, by the media. Um, and uh, there's nothing against this gentleman personally, um, but he is just not a normal person in the eyes of, in the eyes of most people. Uh, if you look just at his helmet, he has a, a camera on his, uh, on his helmet because he, he genuinely doesn't think that he can go for a bike ride without the safety of recording uh, his trip on a bike because the city he lives in is so terrible for cycling. He's got lights back and front on the helmet. His helmet weighs as much as a Tour de France bike, uh, just, uh, just a helmet. If you look at his handlebars, there are more things attached to his handlebars than, uh, than any handlebar should take. And he's got three energy packs in his, uh, in his bike to power the heart rate monitor and the bells and the whistles and the lights and the everything else, the Garmin, I'm sure, um, that's on there. And the back has a complete bike shop in the, in the, in the panniers in, in the back. Probably a defibrillator and a, a, a medical uh, ward as well. Um, and he feels he has to do this for every, every time he gets on a bike. That is just not going to happen. No one else sees themselves, aspires to be this gentleman. Uh, and yet that is how a lot of people see us and think of us. And we have a big job to do to, to change that view. Uh, but it's one that we have to, to undertake. Um, part of the way we're changing our message and part of the growing up process that we're going through in the U.S. bike advocacy, um, I, I, I will illustrate by um, 
speaking to this, uh, this question. I got a chance about two years ago to talk to the board of directors, the head people at the Institute of Transportation Engineers. These are the engineers who uh, are the public works directors and the top transportation officials and in U.S. cities. It's an international uh, organization of traffic engineers. And I was pretty nervous talking to the board of directors of this uh, major professional group. And I gave them the presentation on why they should care about cyclists and what they needed to do to help. And at the end of it, they, they said thank you. And their president, the, the chairman of their board, said, uh, said that's very interesting. I'm designing a street in my hometown in Texas, and I put a bike lane on my in my design, and two cyclists came out and said, we don't want bike lanes, take them out. He, he looked at me in the eye in the middle of this board, boardroom with all these top engineers and said, what do you people want? Make up your mind, was the, was the question, and usually you freak out when that happens. You lose your mind, you can't remember what to say, and about 30 minutes later, you think, ah, damn it, I wish I'd said this. But for once I remembered um, what the right answer was. And the answer was, it's not a question of what cyclists want. It's a question of what you want your community to look like. And if you just want those two gentlemen riding bikes in your town, take the bike lanes out, don't put in any infrastructure, and about a half a percent of the population will ride their bikes, and that's what you'll get. I guarantee it. We see it all over the US. But if you want a different result, if you want a different outcome, I can tell you what you need to do to get 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 15, 30 percent of people riding their bikes in Garland, Texas. It won't happen overnight, and there are lots of political challenges to do that, but technically, I can tell them how to do that. And if that's the outcome you want, I can tell you how to achieve it. So you have to decide what kind of community you want. It's not a question of what cyclists want, it's what you want. So uh, we can now answer that question and uh, turn, it on the, turn it on its head. And as we do that, we're changing the, the face of bicycling, we're changing the face of our movement. We are becoming uh, more inclusive, more equitable. We, are, uh, we have specific initiatives to include people of color, to deal with equity issues, to deal with women. We have a women bike initiative. Again, some of the same uh, uh, strands of conversation that we've heard uh, today is really important to us to move away from the old view of where cycling is or was in the United States to where it is moving forward. This is the future of bicycling in the U.S. Uh, and it's, uh, I hope, a very bright future. Um, and the, the, the language we now use to, to, to present cycling is very different. Again, in 1988, when I moved to the U.S., we couldn't talk about kids. We couldn't talk about safe routes to school because we'd just gotten to the point in the U.S. where cycling was finally considered a grown-up activity, an adult thing, not just a kid's toy. And so for years, I had to put away my slideshow on the safe routes to school and, and, uh, uh, and, and save that for, for later. Now we can use it. We used to not be able to talk about uh, separated facilities and segregated lanes and all the stuff that we now realize is critical to get people riding bikes. That has changed and the conversation has changed along with it. We have to talk uh, and have the luxury of being able to talk about people, about places, about community, about livability. What a fantastic job we have uh, encouraging such healthy, vibrant, fun, uh, valuable activities. Uh, what a lucky job it is. Does it have its frustrations, as we heard this morning before lunch? Of course. Uh, because it's such a simple, such a simple answer to so many complex problems, you just want to hit people and say, come on, get it, do this, it's not that hard. Uh, but some, for some reason it still is. But we're changing. We don't have the luxury of time. All the reasons for which cycling works uh, are, um, are ticking time bombs, whether it's obesity, climate change, uh, urban growth, population growth and migration. Those are, are immense challenges that have the potential to blow up in our faces uh, and, and we don't have the luxury of being able to say, hey, well it took Copenhagen 40 years to get where they are today. Uh, we have about four years. So we're not looking for evolution. We may not go for revolution, 
but we certainly should look for a Belarus. Um, and, uh, and we should be looking for a much more uh, ambitious future. Uh, and we're looking forward, uh, uh, from the League's uh, point of view, to seeing where this wheel will take us. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the next 134 years, if I get to see them all, will be really exciting and really interesting. So that's, uh, that's where we are in the U.S. Um, I want to close by saying that uh, one of the things we've been thinking about is that um, uh, we need to be more uh, deliberate and intentional about the things we do. And there's so much momentum for cycling at the local level in the U.S. that it's time we captured that momentum. And next week we'll be pitching our Secretary of Transportation on creating a new national bike strategy, a new national bike plan. We had one 20 years ago, the National Bicycle and Walking Study, and it guided much of the work that was done at the state and local level for a decade, and then just kind of uh, was forgotten and lost, and uh, the, the impetus is gone. So in 2014, our goal is to reinvigorate and make a case for cycling at the national level with a national bicycling strategy that will find a place for cycling in all the strategies of health and environment and energy and commerce and travel and tourism and economic development uh, so we can be the catalyst for change in all those areas. That's our uh, plan and goal for 2014 and uh, we look forward to sharing the progress with you in years to come. Agradecemos a señor Andy Clark por su brillante exposición.